I'm just trying to get everybody not to act, right? That's it. And, and so it just for the, the scene, the fight, it was not just fighting, but when we were yeah, like carrying Yeah, Thanksgiving. Uh, and it was just one one shot, and you yes. did a lot of, of rehearsal before, or just to, to... So I wrote that scene like five years ago, and, uh, and, 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 and it didn't really change. You know, the script evolved, but that scene didn't change. Los Angeles Times and the Envelope. I'm Mark Olson, and joining us with Justine Trier, we have interpreter Frederick Cassidy. And I want to start by just asking all of you kind of about your relationship to watching movies. I'm wondering if, do there remain movies that are a, a touchstone, an inspiration, something you come back to over the course of your career? Celine? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, in general, I feel like movie watching is something that I feel like takes me back to the way I watched it when I was first watching movies, which is like as a kid. So I think the whatever the purity or whatever the uh, kind of like simplicity with which that you watch a movie has to be a part of the filmmaking as well. Like I feel like if I was bored as a kid, then I'm going to be bored again. <laughs> and if I'm going to be excited as a kid, I'm going to be excited again. So, yeah. Michael, are there certain movies that you come back to? Uh, the movies that I come back to, um, yes, but there really isn't a pattern. I keep, I, uh, except I keep going back to Asphalt Jungle for some reason. There's, uh, you know, for a number of reasons, actually. The performance is a fantastic Marilyn Monroe's first performance, and it's great. But there's, there's a modernity and an intensity to the psychological portrait of the characters in there that's, I never saw that's, it. that's enduring. Mm. You know, it's just, and and, and it, it's a mystery about what makes something sustain in memory and sustain in culture. And that is strange love. Mm. Yeah. This idea that you could make a movie for a mass audience that's completely and totally personal mm. and independent if you have the kind of controls that Kubrick that Kubrick had. Uh -huh. What about you, Alexander? Is there a movie that you can point to that like made you want to direct movies? Uh, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I was a junior in, at uh, college, and I, was, I knew I was going to apply to journalism school and I was, do I really want to dare and go to film school? And of course, my parents were ham hammering me to go to law school. And I was, had been movie crazy my whole life. And then, yeah, I saw uh, at the Castro Theater in San Francisco in spring of 1983, the fully restored Seven Samurai. Oh, yeah. And, you know, kind of an obvious one to trot out, but there you have it. It was my first time. And I thought, the line I said to myself was, I will never climb the mountain that high, but I want to be on that mountain. There it is. Mm -hmm. Wow. And Blitz? Um, well, I, I grew up in Ghana, and, and cinema, there weren't many cinema houses, but what there were were a bunch of evan evangelicals who would um, show films for free outdoors. And so uh, The Last Temptation of Jesus Christ was like a, wow. a staple wow. in every empty soccer park. You could find it was a big deal because it was the one time that you know for those of us who hadn't seen a movie on a big screen, could go sit outside with our mat or our little stool, you know, and 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 it was a big deal. But as I kind of um, time went on, one of the films that I will say really changed it for me was Soy Cuba. Mm. I'm Cuba, mm. and it's interesting because Dan Lost in my DP, that's ended up being up both our favorite films. Mm. Oh, wow. And so, and so, you know, that's kind of what for me got me really excited, just that camera work. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me of how we move back home. It was just free. So anyway, that's, that was the moment I was like, that's cool. I think that's it for me. That's mm. what I want to do. Bradley, did you have a similar moment? Uh, I've worked with Dan Laust, and I love him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, and we talked about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. so funny. Yeah. That's yeah. Mike Alley. Yes, yes. yes. Sure. I love him. He's Austin Lauston. Yeah. Guillermo was a Lauston. <laughs> <laughs> he's wonderful. He's, he's amazing. He's the best. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I could chronicle my whole life through films. Hmm. I mean, I, I feel like so many emotional landmarks in my life are based on films I watched. Um, my backyard with train tracks, and then there was a movie theater, and then I grew up in Philadelphia, and um, 
cable came through, Comcast. So when Prism hit, you know, all of a sudden Raging Bull and Deer mm. Hunter and mm. Apocalypse Now were on television. And so I just uh, digested it. So Did you fall in love with film before falling in love with acting? You know, it's funny you say that, <laughs> sitting here now having, uh, uh, you know, with the movie with all of you. Uh, it was the film. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I was giving myself permission to dream that big. Mm -hmm. I really don't. You know, it wasn't so much just what Anthony Hopkins and John Hurt was doing. It really was David Lynch. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And um, that's what I fell in love with. And I didn't realize that until I started acting and I was so enthralled with the filmmaking process much more than the acting. Mm -hmm. And so I would just stay on set. I was on a television show and I would sit in the editing room for, for like a whole year. I lived in L.A. and I got all the VHS tapes of everybody's dailies and I would watch them. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that's what everybody does. But people looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> But I just loved it so much. Yeah. Wow. Justine, does watching movies remain a, an important part of your process as a filmmaker? Yes, of course, yes. I think with both uh, two two movies very important for me. Uh, of course, opening night from Casavitis. Uh, mm, yes. And uh, always, and when I watching the movie, always all the time I say how it managed everything. I don't understand why why the camera is here and here. It's totally crazy for me. And uh, the Boston Stranglers by Richard Fleischer. Mm. Wow. Mm. For me, it's, it's, uh, it's, I, this movie is so particular. And all the, the, the end with Tony Curtis, this, it's amazing for me. Obviously, I've looked at Le Mans and Grand Prix and uh, a Ford Ferrari, um, which I was involved with. Um, but there was no precedent uh, for, for Ferrari, primarily because of the tempestuous, operatic, dramatic events that are happening uh, in, in their lives behind the uh, kind of iconic facade uh, within those three months that the film takes place. That's the real core of the film. The resolution of some of those dramatic conflicts is in the racing. So it's not really a race car movie. Bradley, with both A Star Is Born and with Maestro, you've made these portraits of artists, how they sort of balance their work and their life. Are these in any way self-portraits? Like, how much of you is in these films? I mean, hopefully uh, all of me is in those, these films. Um, you know, the, I, I think all we're searching for is truth. And um, e even cinematically, I mean, even in the composition, I, I hope is as, as autobiographic as truthful as even the acting or this, the subject matter. Mm. I do think that if it's truthful, you know, then actually it's transcendent. Mm. And I think that, that's what I'm always aiming for. Mm. Michael, I think a lot of people want to assume that, you know, your version, your depiction of Enzo Ferrari, that you're seeing yourself in him. And I know you and I have talked about the fact that you do not see yourself in Enzo right. Ferrari. So what is it that draws you to him? The, um, the, the, the truth, the, uh, the, uh, the facts of life, mm. the way life works, uh, which fascinates me. Um, the, uh, we have contradictions within ourselves, contradictions in marriages and everything, and, and the only place they really resolve is in motion pictures. Mm. They don't resolve in life. Wow. <laughs> we used to go to our grave with the same contradictions wow. and oppositional things, wow. and Enzo was this fascinating character who, uh, behind this iconic facade and the dark glasses, his life is a completely tempestuous, mm. operatic, melodramatic, Mess. A mess. <laughs> and doesn't think so. That's it. And uh, that, and the, and the complexity of the relationship between he and Laura, where they're both attracted to each other you. and they're repelled by each other, they can't us. live what together, they can't live apart. You have another son, you have another wife. She's not my wife, but he is my son. But I don't really see myself in, mm -hmm. in that at all. But, I was, but, but there was something that resonated about, in Troy Kenny Martin's screenplay, which is brilliant, and he captured it all back in the 90s, or something that just resonated as so passionate and, and authentic. Even the resolutions you might expect to happen don't resolve the way you think they do. And it's, um, and it's befitting that there's that aria from Traviata because it also is about things, man and a woman, and out of sync, out of time. Mm -hmm. Celine, your film 
is rooted in an autobiography, like mm -hmm. something that happened to yeah. you, but is there a point where it stops being about you and becomes fiction? Like, do you, do you, like, how does that happen? Well, I think it really did start from this one particular feeling that only I could have had. So that was the kind of the autobiographical personal thing of it, which is like that moment where I was sitting between my childhood sweetheart who had come to visit me from Korea mm -hmm. and my husband that I live with in New York City. And sitting there when I was, uh, you know, sitting between them, translating between these two people, I think that uh, it felt like I was not just translating between these two people in language and culture, but also in be between uh, parts of my own self mm -hmm. and my own history. Wow. And I think that strange feeling, which I was like, there's no way anybody else really will uh, understand this. But then I feel like I, uh, I've over time thought that as I was writing into, writing into a script, from there, it was kind of an objectification of the subject, subjective thing that I was feeling into basically words on a page. This is also a dreamland. The feeling that I had, which was initially, was like, is anybody going to understand this, what to me felt like such a specific feeling? Mm. And what I learn every day uh, with my audience is that absolutely, mm. right? Because my audience is experiencing it subjectively. And I think I know more about uh, my audience's people's uh, childhood sweethearts than any <laughs> filmmaker <Wow>. ever. Because <laughs> they all wanted to come and tell me about it. They're like, well, it was really subjective for me. So, mm, yeah. if, I mean, I talk about the of the autobiographical part being this movie uh, as a just nothing but a you know way for me to feel less lonely. Mm. You know? But isn't it always the case that the more specific something is, the more universal it is? Absolutely. Absolutely. I always think right. that. Yeah, right. I fully believe yeah. that. Yeah. And for this being your first, yeah. <clears throat> what a brilliant piece of Thank art. You. Congrats. It's <laughs> you beautiful, so beautiful work. The Color Purple ultimately is such an emotional story. It's it's based in so much trauma and abuse and I mean the kind of director that thinks about how the, the body registers you know all of this whether you're performing it or whether you, you've lived it. I really am very passionate about figuring out uh, a place of bonding with my cast around which we can talk honestly about subject matter and about how that subject matter is affecting the actor. Checking in with my cast consistently our rehearsal sessions were also pseudo-therapy sessions. I mean, we, of course, read the text and talked about what we were gonna do with, with the text, but it was more about asking ourselves what deep traumas that do we ourselves harbor? Now, Blitz, in The Color Purple, how do you sort of locate yourself in a story like that? Do you find that there's like, do you pick a character that you most identify with, or do you find that you sort of have to love all your children equally and you, you identify equally with all the characters? Well, oof. first, I mean, I, go, I start with Alice Walker's brilliant novel, right? Like, that's the holy grail for me. And then, you know, there's Steven Spielberg's cinematic classic, and then there's a Tony Award winning Broadway play. Mm -hmm. So this piece of art is just, you know, it has such a sprawling world that it, it has already created. It's deeply girl. emotional. It's hollowed ground <laughs> for some people. It's people mm. found healing in this, in this piece of art, in this work. And so for me, the way I came to it was, what am I going to contribute? Mm. And if I have nothing to say, I better back mm. off <laughs> quickly. This ain't me. I hush. Put it on. You're going to be my guest tonight. We need to look like we belong. This woman who's from the rural South, who is poor, you know, semi-literate, who isn't allowed to dream. No, most people have no access to someone like that's headspace. Mm. Um, I said, this is an opportunity to go, irrespective of who you are, you're free up here. And as long as you can free yourself there, then the rest kind of mm. follows. Mm. Wow, dude. Yeah. Alexander, do you find that you have to sort of emotionally connect to your characters? Like, do you need to Id identify with the characters in your stories? 100%. <laughs> what, are you out of your mind? <laughs> <laughs> That's our job, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, we, we have to, especially if we write our characters, we're already in love with them. Mm -hmm. I always think of William Wyler, and uh, he would always say that uh, even if he hasn't written the screenplay, 
it's the director's professional job to find his or her, her way personally into the script. And he always gave the example in uh, Best Years of Our Lives when mm. Frederick March comes home to uh, Myrna Loy. Mm. And it's a beautiful scene where she's in the kitchen and her back is to the, uh, to the front door. And uh, Frederick March returns after five years away at war. And the kids open the door and he says, shh. shh. Mm. And the mother, her, is her back, you know the scene. And you cry 15 mm. minutes into a movie. Well, that's how William Wyler came home to his wife. Mm. He staged it in exactly that way. Mm. So uh, I think we have to make the distinction between movies which are autobiographical and those which are personal. Mm. But it is our job as professionals to make all of our films and our relationship with all of our characters mm. personal. Mm. Yes. Mm. You no, know, I got kicked out of Harvard for hitting him. <laughs> you hit him? What, like punched him out? Nope, I hit him with a car. You got kicked out of Harvard for hitting a guy with a car? By accident. I'd have Jim Beam, please. But he broke three ribs, which was technically his fault because he shouldn't have been in the road. Question for, you know, for, for Bradley. Yeah. When we say you identify with all our characters, not in we see ourselves in the character, but you identify and you project like an actor projects into this character, that character, all of them. There's also a process where you find yourself projecting into the whole movie as if the movie's a character, mm. you know. And and um, I'm, just, I'm just curious because I went to work uh, as a as a writer a million years ago with Dustin Hoffman when he was going to direct Straight Time, mm. and he started directing Straight Time. And after three, we're in Folsom Prison and amongst the mainstream population, and three days in, he fired himself <laughs> because huh. he could not possibly act the way he acts, and then stop that, and then move behind mm. the camera and direct. So mm. when I see this beautiful last movie you made, yeah. uh, which I think is fantastic, um, I, I'm wondering about that, that um, how, you, how, you, how you do that, how do you manage the different modalities, or are there two different modalities? And, and, uh, well, first of all, thanks for saying that. Um, I think it's because I grew up uh, lucky enough to make a living as an actor, and because I just shared with you, I was always thinking about the process of making films uh, on a set. At 40 years old, you know, Clint was kind enough to really, we kind of made that movie together, American Sniper, and that was, and, and even David O. Russell was so collaborative. And so by the time I got to Star is Born, I really felt like I was in, a, in the sweet spot artistically, mm -hmm. where I was like, yeah. this is the center, this feels. So when you think of it sort of objectively, it looks like it's complicated, but it actually actually felt the most um, mm -hmm. fluid process for me. Um, and but, but there's no video village, so we're all sort of in the center. There's no chairs on the set. And, um, and I had a lot of time to prep for both of these movies I spent four to six years on. Oh, wow. so, so, that was, so everything was really dialed in. Um, but how much do you run back and watch a take of yourself? But I don't, there's nowhere to run. I mean, no but even a clamshell. Yeah, the, like yeah just... I'll watch it back. Mostly I won't I'll watch back, but if I do, I'll watch it two times speed, you know, fast forward with no sound, just to make sure that we, with the nut, making uh -huh, sure that yeah. it was exactly what I had set yeah. up. Um, but rhythm of a day is so important, so important. And um, yeah, that's sort of how 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 I do it. Um, and 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 I also would show up. You know, we would Lenny would be banked. The character would be banked months before we would start right. shooting. Mm. If if that wasn't the case, Michael, I'd be terrified. <laughs> I mean, literally, I would I would I would mm. throw up. You know, and I wouldn't be able to move. Mm. But so uh, because Lenny Leonard Bernstein in this case was banked, then I just I show and it's him. And, and thank God the crew didn't laugh at me. But, you know, he was directing the movie, mm, you know, yeah. and it was funny because depending on what age he was, the rhythm of the day changed. Yeah, wow. You know, so they were like, oh, young Lenny, this is going to be a fast one. <laughs> it was really crazy. <laughs> And, That's but, funny. But it was also beautiful as an actor because you're yeah. constantly talking and you're free and yeah, you're setting up yeah, shots. Yeah. So, so you're you're almost rehearsing yeah. selfishly as an actor while you're directing oh. the film that it just goes right in. Wow. And I think it actually serves the other actors because they're watching me sort of jump off a cliff. Yeah. And so they're much more willing to jump off the cliff also. That's great. So when Lenny's cranky, the director's cranky. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Blame it on him. <laughs> yeah. I'm on a Knox. The story of the young American uh, women in Peru, in Italy, who's judged for killing her roommate. It was really, really, yes, I was very inspired by that, that case because of how every man uh, were looking at that woman and 
and judge that woman, not just for the case, but because she was so beautiful, so clever, so, you know, and they, invite, they invented a lot of very stupid things about her uh, sexual lives and, you know, and I was very inspired. Justine, you, you co-wrote Anatomy of a Fall with your husband. Yeah. The story is about a woman accused of murdering her husband. And I know that the two of you have been asked about this quite a bit, but did it cause you, the two of you, to examine your own relationship at all as you were writing the story? Um, he's alive, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, For now. No, I think it's really weird that we were, like, blind, you know? We, we didn't discuss about this. Je pense qu'on était beaucoup plus absorbé par le, le projet a tellement pris de... Vous savez, je pense quand on travaille comme ça, on n'est plus vraiment euh, un couple, en fait. Je crois qu'il y avait une espèce de stimulation très forte qui a mis ça à distance. Je crois vraiment que, évidemment, euh, comme vous disiez tout à l'heure, on met tous nos... C'est très proche de nous, on met toutes nos peurs, toutes nos angoisses dans les films. Mais pour moi, il y a quelque chose de, presque de, de l'ordre de l'exorcisme, en fait. C'est-à-dire qu'en fait, c est, c est, parce que c'est fait, c'est plus à vivre, presque, en fait. Et ça, c'est quelque chose de, que je ressens très fort. Donc peut-être qu'il y a des choses que j'ai peur de vivre, que j'ai mis dedans. Mais je crois qu'on n'a on a jamais... Euh, on, est, on est narcissique, mais peut-être pas au point de, 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 de vraiment se, 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 se dire que vraiment, c'est notre vie. Euh, voilà. J'adore l'idée de fiction pour ça aussi, pour se cacher derrière la fiction. So as a couple, to answer your question, um, we, it, it started taking such, the story and the writing of it, developing of it, started taking this huge scale. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden we put ourselves aside, but we could put our fears into the story, mm -hmm. our anguishes, our doubts. And to some degree, the process becomes an exorcism mm. where you uh, where you don't have to live these things because you expulse them mm. through the story. And so um, there may be some narcissism involved, of, of course, but they, that gets passed up uh, to the point of you can hide behind the fiction. Mm. I just want you to know one thing. I'm not, I am not that, that I'm not that monster, you know? Everything you hear in the trial, uh, it's just, it's twisted. I have a question, because I feel like this question of, if the, this is connected to what Alexander was saying about the personal versus autobiographical. Because yeah. I feel like because my story did start from an autobiographical place, and I've, I always assume that that's part of the reason why sometimes there's a conflation of the personal and the autobiographical. But just you being asked the question about <laughs> you being married, you know, and things like that, I was just wondering, like, what you thought about the... Because uh, I feel like there's a very real difference between autobiographical and personal. Because I feel like... Yeah. And this is something that I feel with uh, just talking to you guys for a little bit, which is that sometimes it's... Is it just a matter of personal stakes? Because... Yeah. I can tell that everybody cares so much yeah. about the yes, movies yes, that you guys yes, made. Yes, yes. Like, mm -hmm. I know you care so much, Justine, about uh, this feeling real and human and feels true to you. And mm -hmm. there's such a, I don't know, this, I feel like, and I think maybe that's all we maybe mean by personal, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think it just means that, like, I just really, really gave a crap, you know? <laughs> and I can just tell that, like, you know, like the way you're talking about it, uh, directing, too. I'm just like, well, there's so much uh, caring happening, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I think, of course, the main thing is, it's very really personal, I think, not autobi autobiographical, sorry. But uh, yes, I think the main thing is just, you know, to talk about the, the how we can live together, how we can, you know, mm -hmm. this thing, it's, it's, it's not so natural to be <laughs> doing couple. And, yeah. and the question of the reciprocity, I think it's the main thing in my movie, you know, and the creation and how you, you manage, you know. And um, of course, these things is really personal, of course, but not just my thing, you know, it's so... And yes, it was the, the, the heart of the things. And of course, um, aussi, sorry, uh, la, la, la question vraiment de, de, comment dire, de, 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 quand on est une femme et d'avoir, uh, comment dire, d'être pas une parfaite victime, c'est-à-dire d'être quelqu'un qui, qui est plutôt, uh, comment dire, assez... Uh, euh, qui a une forme de, 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 de certitude, qui ne s'excuse pas, de prendre de la place, etc. Je pense que ça, c'est une chose vraiment que j'ai... Qui, qui, que je trouvais vraiment... Un, que j'avais envie d'explorer, en fait, encore plus. Et, et forcément, je suis touchée par cette question-là. La question de ne pas être une bonne victime, d'être une femme qui prend, voilà, qui prend de la place, qui a une forme de pouvoir et qui est forcément beaucoup plus jugée par la société. En tout cas, dans mon film, ça l'est. Hein. Mmh. 
<clears throat> so one of the questions that I wanted to explore was the character of a woman who is uh, not a perfect victim. Mm -hmm. She doesn't make apologies mm -hmm. for herself. Mm -hmm. She occupies the space that she is in. And so it, there is a form of power in mm. that. Um, but that was what I was <laughs> interested in exploring. It's, it's a, the, the woman's journey mm. in this film. It's, and she's more judged because of oh, yes. that. Yes, 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 yes. I think she's, yes, she's more attacked in yeah. the trial mm. because, in the courtroom, because of this. Mm. No? Because she's not crying all the time. She's not, you know, mm -hmm. she's just, and yes. <laughs> Unapologetic. Mm -hmm. yeah, Unapologetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm curious if why is a question that you ask yourselves. Alexander, like, I know, you know, filmmakers often have a number of projects they're working on at a given time. Like, for you, do you have to ask yourself the question of, like, why do I want to make this movie now? Because the script is ready. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. So real. It's that simple. So That's true. it. Mm. I'm just interested in the act of making a film. I'm a little slow. Yes, I have two or three uh, screenplays I'm nudging along, but in my case, this one was ready. Mm -hmm. And I, then I look, had something to run with. Mm -hmm. And like thematically, like, oh, I wanted to say this, or this came out, that's secondary. Mm -hmm. The first urge is the urge to make a film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? This poor woman is bereft, and all you can think about is some silly girl. I don't need you feeling sorry for me. See? I'm just saying, this was the first good thing that came with being in this prison with you. Michael, knowing how long it's taken you to make the Ferrari project, is it similar? Like, what is it that keeps you driven to make that movie as long as it yeah. took? The project started with Sidney Pollack, myself, the late mm. Sidney Pollack, myself, and, and uh, Troy Kenny Martin mm. in 1994. Mm. And and it was just this this idea that, that this, it was uh, something we, 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 you said about, uh, about the more specific it gets, the more universal something mm -hmm. comes. The uh, the story of these lives and these romances and the complications of these people just resonated with something. It was so specifically modern. Asset. The more specific it became, you know, the more the more universal it became. But then um, I wound up controlling the project. Then Sydney and I were together for a while on it, and then um, and we were until he passed away. And then the um, you know the book had to come up for reoption. I say it's insane. I've tried to put this movie together three times. No car racing movie has ever made any money ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Teo and Greta, it's like when they first met, it was over Zoom. I really loved it that way. I wanted it to sort of build over Zoom because, of course, in the film, they have to build their chemistry over Skype. And something that I also asked them to do is Greta and Teo, they were not allowed to uh, touch each other, not even a handshake, until they shot the scene in the film where they hug each other for the first time in 24 years. So it's not really a matter of like, you guys have to get very close and really physically close and intimate like that. It was so much more about, actually, no, no, we're gonna um, almost unnaturally uh, keep you guys apart because um, it's gonna make you miss each other. Because I think the longing, that sense of uh, desire to touch each other, I think is uh, really at the heart of the relationship between uh, these two characters. Bradley, I'm so curious for you, what made you, in telling the story of Leonard Bernstein, made you want to focus on Bernstein's marriage to Felisa, to Montalegre. Felicia Montalegre? Yeah. Um, well, it's been said here, you know, it's trying to do something that's healing. Musically, I agree with you. I mean, movies is just one musical element, and just I love just hearing the melody of these two people talk to each other, mm. and then just how sort of unique and unorthodox this marriage, this true love I, I found, uh, was and I thought there's an interesting story. So mm -hmm. if I could tell that story, where somebody maybe would be go will go into it having a, other sort of ideas just early on in the film of what they think is love and what marriage is, and by the end of it, maybe it's changed their mind and maybe they're relating to this iconic person and woman uh, in ways that they never thought they could. That's always the goal. Mm -hmm. So that I thought, oh, I have an opportunity there. Mm -hmm. And then it's nuclear because it's, it's Leonard Bernstein's music. So mm -hmm. I thought. Oh, a movie about marriage, and it'll be one musical element scored to his music. And that's sort of uh, how, how it became a movie about marriage. Oh, life is not that serious. Honest, it isn't. What age are we living in? One can be as free as one likes without guilt or confession. <laughs> Please, what's the harm? I know exactly who you are. It's... 
give it a whirl. Celine, in, in your film, the depiction of the husband, like it does not become this sort of tale of jealousy that I think most people would tell the story in that way. It's funny, I saw uh, the actress Greta Lee, mm -hmm. your star of your film, she referred to the Celine Song brand of radical restraint. <laughs> and Sweet. I found that to be a, just a really fascinating concept. Mm -hmm. And is that something that you specifically sort of brought to the depiction of marriage in, in the film? Yes, I mean, I think that uh, more than anything, I was really interested in, uh, you know, uh, three, because often so much uh, drama and so much adult drama happens because uh, adults are behaving like children. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in a story where uh, these people that we meet as children uh, having to behave like adults. And a part of it is, is the husband character uh, of uh, my main character, Nora, she, when he enters the story, he enters midway into the film. And we've already established a love story between the, the main two characters. So I don't expect my audience to look at him and welcome him into the movie. Right? I want them to all be like, go back to where you came from. Go away. You know, I don't want them to like, I, I don't expect them to like this character. Um, and of course, um, this is something that my actor, John Magaro, and I were uh, working on the whole time. He is fighting for his life and he's fighting for uh, his place in the story. And part of that is to depict a good marriage, mm. which I felt like um, I couldn't, it was such a strange thing because for something to be a good marriage, it's like more you insist that it's a good marriage, um, less believable. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. some of it is about actually uh, getting to the bottom of where uh, their intimacy uh, has its limits. He's really masculine in this way that I think is so Korean. Are you attracted to him? I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, I don't think so. With the holdovers, I'm being asked a lot right now about Christmas movies. I didn't really think I was making a Christmas movie. And I'm being asked, well, like, what's your favorite Christmas movie? And I have to say, of course, Capra's It's a Wonderful Life, but which is also not just a Christmas movie. I mean, I guess it is, and people watch it then. But it's a towering masterpiece. Alexander, you've always had such a strong eye for casting people early in their career, whether Laura Dern in Citizen Ruth or Reese Witherspoon in Election, and now with Dominic Sessa in The Holdovers. What is it that gives you this eye for talent? What are you looking for in, in untapped talent? This guy, Dominic Sessa, was really, he had never been in front of a camera before. He was an actual high school senior, now being asked to play a high school junior. And, uh, I don't know, man. I think it's our job, like one of our key directorial jobs, to spot talent mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. and see an essence, whether the actor is trained or untrained, mm. Mm -hmm. and then see if that actor can be, the word I like to use is bulletproof mm. enough in front of the camera, the unblinking cyclops mm -hmm. and the lights and the bearded men with walkie-talkies and the trucks and all that kind of crap when they, uh, when they get to set. No wonder you're afraid of women. I am not afraid of women. Jesus. Sorry, I shouldn't have said anything. It's... Dr. Gertler says I don't always give consideration to my audience. Oh. And who is Dr. Gertler? My shrink. I I'm really curious, guys, because, I mean, and this is like, you know, everyone's film, um, beautiful films. I'm curious about rehearsals for you guys. Mm -hmm. Justine, you know, you know, the long scenes with like long dialogue you i mean it's like long dialogues you know like what is rehearsals to you you know what i mean like i'm just curious what are rehearsals yeah you know i mean i mean like uh, what like what like what do you what do you see out of it rehearsals are knowing when to stop there's <laughs> knowing when to stop when how far to rehearse yeah uh, you know been, i mean you never want to have you never want to have something say i wish i had a camera here that's mm. that's, that's the worst mm. so it's, it's interesting. It, for me, it depends of with who with who you work because sometimes actors, you know, they are so uh, with the first takes, it's better. It depends with you know. I'm afraid of re rehearsals because mm. my first movie, <laughs> I did a lot, and it was better before uh, than on set. Mm -hmm. But I think it depends uh, on that movie. It was very, very funny because uh, Sandra Hüller was so you know so 
special. The first take was so, so crazy, so good. So I just said to my DP, OK, please sh we, uh, sh shoot since the lockdown. Don't do the lock, the lock uh, how do you say in English, the, the, après, le moment avant qu'on shoot, en gros. Il faut que déjà il tourne, en gros. Je ne sais pas okay, comment dire ça. Just the final uh, uh, run through. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, because she was so great. So yeah. after, I, I, I was running on just to, yeah. to get back to yeah. the, the first one. Yeah. But I think it's, I, I, I do a lot of takes. So yeah. I, lo I love so much to, you know, when actors could uh, take <coughs> the time and the space to spread out, you know, mm. and to... I don't, I'm the opposite of the director who say, okay, baby, just go do this and do it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm, I love so much yeah. when actors could go on the wrong direction, you know, mm. and to find sometimes something so interesting after, wow. you know, so. Bradley, do you, how do you feel about rehearsing? <laughs> um, well, casting is major, right? Oh, that's, that's like half of the rehearsal, I think. Is like, have, is there somebody's soul that you think will really fit this character mm -hmm. and help tell the story? And then um, it's, I like to work individually with everybody uh, leading up to the film. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then I really just try to create a space that uh, they're going to feel absolutely um, safe to, to be uh, unsafe. Good. You know, wow. that's the goal. And, it, and again, it helps that I'm on the field with them. Yes, yes. Um, but, uh, you know... What I learned from Mr. Eastwood is shoot the rehearsal, mm. and uh, I certainly always shoot the rehearsal. Wow. Um, <laughs> brilliant. And, and in this movie, you know, everything was so structured. Uh, we weren't really doing coverage, so... Uh, it, and, and I would say that we're going to do this and sort of block it out a bit, but I really would spend the time dialing in exactly what everything was going to be, create the environment. I don't ever say action. I just kind of bring them in. And But it is a sink or swim environment. Wow. I mean, I think that everybody realized coming into it, if you weren't prepared, it was not going to go well. Yeah. You know, yeah. so um, and I came up with directors like that, and I, and I love that. Right. Um, like, with, like with Clint, uh, Clint, David O. Yeah, uh -huh. you know, I remember Sienna Miller's first day on American Sniper. We were coming, he's like, Yeah, so we're gonna uh, come in here, and, uh, <laughs> and then Sienna's like, This is wonderful. Isn't it? And I was like, Yeah, we're gonna hug, we hug this thing, go, and she's like, All right, Clint. So he's like, All right, I'll see you Monday. <laughs> I was like, Wait, did we shoot? We <laughs> sure did. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It was this tarmac what? scene. Yeah, it was okay. nuts. <laughs> yeah. it was nuts. Uh, Pacino, we were working with Al Pacino on two films. Al always gets there on, on somewhere between takes five and eight. Wow. But, you know, if it, mm -hmm. you know, except when. Except because of how he works, except when, uh, you know, if you go into a cover set and there's a scene that he hasn't learned, then it's a whole different thing. Right. Because he, he learns his scenes word perfect two weeks before he shoots them. Mm -hmm. So he never has a script. So he's right. dreaming the wow. scene yeah. and everything else. Wow. wow. And, you know, but... Um, Wow. Yeah, and my story, the last take is, I think, we use the last take of every of every scene. That's so interesting. Yes. I was also about to ask that. Are you guys like, you know, last take, it's the take? It just happened to be. Sometimes, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, Alexander, like you I'm a three to six kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Alex, me too. I love it. Three to six. <laughs> three to, in general, I'm kind of a three to six kind of guy. <laughs> you know, I don't want to say anything to the actors at the beginning, so yeah. takes one and two, I want to see what the actors have been thinking about yeah. and how they prepare. I don't want to mess with anything. Mm. And then I can, then by about take three, I can jump in and start helping them sculpt a little bit. Well, why, what were you doing here? Well, oh, okay, all right. Well, I think that we can say that we've got it here today. I thank all of you for Good. being here. This has been a wonderful wow. conversation. Beautiful. And thank thanks you. for having us. Okay. I got to say, it is so fun to hang out with other filmmakers. I, I mean, I know I we have this like, oh, promote our movie yeah, yeah. thing yeah, going yeah. on. <laughs> but, but forget that, because we don't meet one another otherwise. <laughs> we, directors live in our individual fiefdoms. True. True. So it's in these periods that we get to meet each other. Yeah. And it's a real gift. Thank you, thank guys. You guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're asking about a soundtrack I like, and I like very, very many. But the one that's popping into mind right now is I like George Delarue's soundtrack for uh, Black Robe, a Bruce Beresford picture from the, I think from the 90s. It's an underseen uh, movie about the fight between the Huron and the Iroquois up in Canada, and a French Jesuit who gets caught in between them and uh, it has really, really beautiful music. Well, the film score that I think about so much is The Phantom Thread. It's a beautiful, beautiful film score. I think about it all the time. If you just 
talk about music, it's a long goodbye from uh, a long goodbye from its best uh, uh, band original. Sorry, soundtrack. So it depends of what you you know of of uh, if it's music or if it's just the sound of actors and the music. You know. These questions were so deep, you guys. I thought this was gonna be. I thought we we're gonna be like. I'm Name from Movie, and this is the LA Times Envelope Directors Roundtable.